We're just a sweaty pianist in the park talking about how to improve articulation by way of reading out loud. That's it. <laughs> well, hi there, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I've been away for, for a few days here and uh, had that recital last weekend. It went very well, the silent film with piano event, very well. And I've had a few other gigs, plus some more coming up. And so uh, I'm chomping at the bit, waiting to get back to Mr. B, <laughs> the preludes and fugues, the inverted voices, inventions, and all of this good stuff. But uh, we're, we're just not there yet. But I do have on my mind something that's very important, at least to me. And as piano teachers, you know, we always talk about how to improve your articulation. And in my early days of piano studies, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, but if I heard a teacher demonstrate a scale that was played very like muddy and sloppy versus one that was played very clean, ah, well then it was very obvious to me. <laughs> and so you, you hear enough demonstrations like that and then you come to understand, oh, that's what articulation is. But it was never really pointed out to me, and I never really realized this until, well, much, much later in life, that good articulation at the piano comes from being interested in the voice. I find that listening, paying attention to speech, and reading aloud is incredibly useful for improving your articulation. I have no actual proof of this in, in terms of my teaching. Well, perhaps a little bit of proof, actually. Um, of course, when I go to adjudicate, uh, I don't get to hear the kids talk. <laughs> I hear them play, and other than a few words, thank you, Miss Johnson, you know, I don't really hear them talk. Um, with students, um, I do find in general, and, you, and if you're a teacher, you can let me know in the comment uh, if you know uh, if you've noticed this kind of thing, but that students who who mumble, you know, they're, they're just kind of hard to understand what they're saying. They don't form clear consonants and you know articulate the syllables of the word. Um, oftentimes, they're they're playing at the piano. Their finger work, their articulation, is muddy as well, muddy and unclear. Um, it's not a blanket rule, but it's just something that I've noticed over the years. And um, it seems that people long ago, like in the earlier part of the 20th century, uh, they spoke slower and they spoke, they spoke more poetically, more musically. I can think back to when I was little and I was reading, you know, the Pippi Longstocking books. Oh, I loved those. <laughs> I used to feel like I was Pippi Longstocking, minus the, the horse and the monkey on the shoulder and the, what, what did she have, a pirate father or something? But uh, her, her adventurous spirit and uh, uh, her, her rugged outdoorsness, uh, that, that resonated with me. But, but I remember reading those books aloud. I really enjoy, and still do, reading out loud. It's always interesting to to sign out audiobooks from the library, you know. I can't tell you how many I have put back on the shelf after listening to just 30 seconds. Oh, this, the, the, the hint, any hint of an aggressive, forceful, abrupt cadence to the voice just immediately sets my skin <laughs> curdling and just twitching with, with discomfort. Um, and then sometimes you find a voice that's just so melodious and it's just like hypnotic, almost sucks you in. Um, and we all have our different preferences too. In the same way that not everyone likes uh, how I play Bach. <laughs> and I know because uh, I've had some comments, you know, some folks think I, I cross the line too much with, with tempo or what have you. Um, but you got to do what feels right to you. And I feel like if you spend enough time on something and you devote your life to it, <laughs> as I do playing Bach, um, although not lately <laughs> with these various other obligations, but to devote that kind of passion and time um, 
plus the fact that I'm not harming anyone by playing this music the way I hear it, um, then you're entitled to do that, you know? And whether it's your hobby or your career, you should play as you see fit. But always, always with the notion of uh, communicating through sound. I think if we pay attention to not just our own voice, but to the other, the voices of others around us, even if we're just going to the grocery store or we're sitting in a park watching people go by and hearing them from afar um, on the radio, whatever it is, paying attention to the cadence of people's speech patterns, the, the inflection, whether they go up on the end, whether it goes down on the end, all of these things, the pitch, certainly how high or how low they talk, and how much space is between their words. There's just so many things about the human voice that I find so curious. And, and that's why I love radio, because <laughs> it's like a disembodied voice. What was that Marshall McLuhan's phrase, I think? Um, the disembodied voice. <laughs> I have here a hammer. <laughs> this is a, right now this is as close as I am to owning a Steinway, <laughs> but this is an official Steinway hammer um, made of wool and maple. Speaking of wood, I'm surrounded by wood. <laughs> here I am at Newark Park. Uh, Newark is in New Jersey, <laughs> uh, but this is in Niagara on the Lake. Newark Park in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, very close to the American border with the New York. And I wanted to, I've been wanting to come here to do some filming for a while because it's just so pretty. Um, and we got all these trees. I have an app on my phone for identifying different trees and plants, flowers and things. And uh, <laughs> of course I had to move the camera around many times to find a place to put it where the lighting was good and where I wasn't sweating in the middle of the sun. <laughs> um, and uh, at one point over there I was sitting underneath uh, a white oak and just before that I was underneath a black walnut and actually the black walnut was dropping these <laughs> big humongous leaves, I mean like large, longer than my hand. And with these black, gnarly things on the, on the end of the stem there. Uh, and I thought that was appropriate, you know, black, black walnut and a white oak for a piano player. Piano keys, black and white. <laughs> uh, we had over here, shoot, uh, what was it? I looked it up. Um, is it a hickory tree? Yeah, a hickory tree. And then this little guy over here is a plum tree. And uh, southern, shoot, I, f I forgot the, the name of the tree. I'll, I'll put it on the, um, on the text for you to see. There's all sorts of kinds of plants here, um, including many that would be otherwise grown in the uh, more southern United States. We get such lovely foliage and, uh, and fruit. That's the other thing. Um, of course, where I live in St. Catharines is part of the Niagara region, um, but here, which is just 15 minutes from my home, it's not far at all, in Niagara-on-the-Lake, here, we are surrounded in wineries. I think Trias Winery is just over there. Uh, I, I don't really drink wine, so I don't, uh, I mean, if someone's serving it, <laughs> I'll have some, but <laughs> haven't been around anyone serving anything lately. Um, and I'd rather spend my money on books. <laughs> Which, by the way, I brought a few with me. Because <laughs> if we're talking about uh, oration and reading aloud, speech and all these things, you gotta have some good stuff to read. <laughs> um, but no, there are wineries. There's just countless wineries. I tried to get some footage. Um, this is only mid-June, so the little wine, little grape bushes are just, they're just wee, <laughs> they're very cute but they're all over the place. Getting back to what I was talking about with the speech, you know, um, I've, I've noticed too, 
I mean, usually it's the, the young people who, who maybe don't speak in such long, you know, thought out sentences. <laughs> but I have noticed uh, that, that a lot of the older people even are now speaking in short, uh, incomplete sentences, short form, almost point form. It doesn't fill the void of saying something truly meaningful. You need words for that and that's hard to do. Um, and so it's just been interesting to see that even with the older generation uh, there seems to be less awareness to, to writing in prose, like speaking in sentences, paragraphs, versus verse, <laughs> poems and things like that. And I was going through this little book by Northrop Fry. He was a Canadian. He taught, I think, at the University of Toronto. Um, and this book is called The Well-Tempered Critic. And if you're, if you're familiar with even the most basic music of Bach, then you've probably heard the phrase well-tempered clavier. Hmm? Well, Bach was Northrop Frye's favorite composer. And it's no coincidence that this book is called The Well-Tempered Critic. And uh, I haven't read the whole thing. <laughs> Such a Gemini, right? <laughs> going from book to book, never really completing anything. Um, but I will complete this. Uh, but I was just so interested how he was talking about, um, uh, you know, kids when they're in school and they learn poems. And poems are wonderful, especially if they have a rhyme to them. It, it sort of instills naturally a sense of music to the voice. and. Uh, uh, I think that seems to come a little bit more perhaps to little kids, although I don't work with really little kids. Um, but it just got me thinking about poetry and it's, it's really not a part of uh, the lives of many adults that I know. And yet that can be such a wonderful way, if you teach piano, the use of uh, reciting poems can be very helpful. I do this with lessons with students sometimes. Um, this is a book I sometimes use. It's the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Quotations. And I'll just uh, look up something like, I don't know, imagination, boom. And then it gives me a bunch of quotes uh, by famous writers about imagination. And I'll often just pick one of these and then hand the book to the student. Or if we're online, I'll just take a picture and screenshot, send it to them and have them read it out loud. I had a poem by, was it William Blake last week at a lesson um, that I had a student read aloud. It's always interesting to get students to read out loud. Most of the time they look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> like, what does this have to do <laughs> with piano playing? Um, and then they read it and then I think they're still kind of like, we should be doing my scales, right? <laughs> And then I'll have them read it again, and then maybe we'll try to um, repeat back to them how, how I hear them saying it. Because a lot of the times, students, if they have, students tend to not read out loud. I'm finding that. Um, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get at here. If you teach piano, you can so easily give your student anything. <laughs> it's so easy to find poems. Um, just keep a book by your piano and each each lesson or every other week give that student a poem something that, that's their level reading of reading wise and get them to read it out loud read it several ways I have this this poem called Marigolds and it's by the Canadian poet Bliss Carmen actually he lived much of his life in the United States he was born in the Maritimes of Canada uh, he lived from 1861 to 1929, and when I was in high school, I came across this poem of his, and I, I loved it instantly. And uh, I'll read it to you. The marigolds are nodding. I wonder what they know. <laughs> Go, listen very gently. You may persuade them so. Go, be their little brother, as humble as the grass, and lean upon the hill wind and watch the shadows pass. Put off the pride of knowledge, put by the fear of pain. You may be counted worthy to live with them again. 
Be Darwin in your patience. Be Chaucer in your love. They may relent and tell you what they are thinking of. And if I give this poem to some piano students, and I have not given this particular poem, but just as an example, based on what I, I hear, a student would likely read it like this. The marigolds are nodding. I wonder what they know. Go listen very gently. You may persuade them so. Go be their little brother. Da 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 These downward inflections. Da 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 Actually, that's a good rhythm if we want some some kind of pop band kind of beat going on. Um, but it's the same over and over again, and they don't realize it because, frankly, that's how adults speak a lot of the time, too. Um, but then when you just invite them to turn that switch on and put a little bit more variety into the inflection, sometimes you maybe want to go up, sometimes you want like a squiggle, and that's where it gets musical. I just love that. I absolutely love that. The CBC back, back, well, now still, but especially back in the day, oh, they had some really good broadcasters. Barbara from she had a nice voice. Um, and, and that other guy, I can't remember his name, but I'll put it on the screen. Um, such a clear, clear voice. If you think about pianists too, famous pianists, um, in particular Bach pianists, the ones that I can think of, they all have incredibly clear diction. If you think of Glenn Gould, oh my gosh, it's almost too clear for me. Um, it's, it's, his speech is very much like his playing style. It's very bright, it's icy and clean and it's often quite quick. Uh, his, his mind moved at a rapid pace. Um, I almost have to listen to it in slow motion to get, to get it. Um, but it's so clear, the articulation, and never monotone. Rosalind Turek, I've mentioned her. Um, she was the one who inspired me to invert the voices on the inventions, which you all seem to be enjoying. And I will get more of those up on the channel. But she did countless videos where she's talking about Bach's music. Oh my gosh, no one, no one speaks more, more, I don't know, magisterial <laughs> than, than Rosalind Turek. Uh, Wanda Landowska, another great Bach uh, keyboardist. Her speech, same thing, incredibly clear. Angela Hewitt, same thing. Um, and uh, I can think of a lot of other pianists too, but I'll just mention those Bach players because that's sort of really what, what I'm focused on here. But this applies to all repertoire and it's just so much fun. You know, I think it's important to get a variety of activities inside of a piano lesson. It's not just play the piece through from start to finish two times then play a couple bars with the metronome and then scribble some stuff in and send the kid home. No, you wanna, even if the clock goes past the hour, so be it. If you can uh, turn on a switch in their mind that gets them to think about something, especially like this, uh, getting them to read out loud because that means that they're thinking about it, not just when they're at the piano, but when they're away from the piano. And that is the clincher. Because to really play well, whatever music you play, to play it well, it needs to be on your mind, basically all the time. And I just love getting inspiration from non-musical things. I have to tell you, I had this, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but, um, Twice in the past, I don't know, week or so, and what, actually when it happened, it was within the span of about three days, I had two old guys come up to me and just tell me a joke. <laughs> it was really it was quite, quite unexpected. The first one, um, maybe five or six days ago, and I was walking on my street. I was almost at my driveway with some groceries in my hand. It was hot and I was kind of tired and I was thinking about the concert I had coming up and this car pulls up beside me 
slows down. This guy's got his window rolled down, this old old dude, and he says, Hey, how do you cook how do you cook alligator? And I looked at him kind of bewildered and I and I said and I just kept walking and he says, In a crock pot <laughs> And then, literally, a day or two later, I was at the Food Basics. Um, that's the really low-budget grocery store here in Ontario. But anyway, I was there in the frozen food aisle, just walking, and there was a man, another old man, <laughs> coming the opposite way down the aisle, and he was in an electric uh, scooter, like wheelchair thing. And it was kind of crowded because there were people looking at the juice and stuff, and so I just stopped and I let him go. So he went, and as he got right beside me, uh, and I had my mask on, and most others did not have a mask on, and uh, I think maybe he thought I was nervous, but he appreciated that I let him go. And uh, he just stopped there right, right in front of me and said, I got a joke for you. And I said, oh no, <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> and he says, why did the teddy stop eating? I said, why? He says, because he was stuffed. <laughs> ah. uh, I've been so fortunate to have wonderful, wonderful piano teachers. Um, yeah, there's thunder. It's, it's echoing what I'm saying. I'm going to need to pack this in soon. Um, but I've been thinking a lot lately about my various piano teachers and they've all been incredibly supportive and wonderful to me. And so many piano teachers, in fact, many of mine, okay, I need to, I need to. you know, so many piano teachers uh, consider their students their children. And uh, I've had some teachers for whom that was the case. And I do feel like a, one of their musical children and uh, always grateful to that and hope that my students will feel that way as well. I could talk a little bit more. <laughs> You've been hearing some thunder and it, we are due for some rain. So I, I'm gonna need to pack this up. Um, but I did, you know, I had scribbled a whole bunch of stuff in my notebooks here. Other people who, who spoke so well, T.S. Eliot. Uh, Langston Hughes, Virginia Woolf, Joan Crawford, <laughs> the old movie actress from the 40s and 50s, 1930s too. Oh, there's uh, someone put up a, a video on here on YouTube of Joan Crawford reading her autobiography. Man, if I could put her voice in a jar and like take a pill every day <laughs> so I could talk like that, I would be one happy camper. Um, I think I speak better through my hands than my mouth, but you know, we do our best. My mom always used to say when I would be writing essays for school, in elementary school, and I would tend to write the, each line on the page very close together, like really crowded. And she, was, uh, she had an English degree and I would share my work with her and she always loved reading it. And <laughs> we had so much fun. Um, and she would say, space that out, it's too crowded. You need to air it out, use, use the whole page. <laughs> you know, it's just one piece of paper, honey. Spread it out. And, uh, and that stood with me too, in terms of how we play at the piano, how we speak. You don't wanna jam all your words together. My teacher at Manhattan School, who I've talked about and will be sharing a lot more, um, she used to say, you must listen for the spaces between the notes. And it's so true. Your furniture in your house, you don't squish it all in the small radius so it's all touching each other. You s spread it out. So when you're teaching too, you can use that analogy for space. Don't squish all your notes together and make them all tight and pressed and squeezed and crowded. Give them some room to breathe, you know? Uh, this is why I love making analogies between my music and non-musical things. I'm gonna need to pack this up. One final thing, <laughs> you know, um, fortunately I didn't need to use these tools, 
but I got some sticks here and one really really long branch I'm not sure which tree this is off of but it's because I saw a warning over here and I'll show you a picture of it that there have been coyotes in this park and it said if you are confronted with one then wave your arms face it wave your arms yell scream make yourself big and loud um, throw something in its direction <laughs> so, so I got got several sticks <laughs> and uh, jingle your keys but fortunately I didn't have to use that no coyotes today well, we did have a fair bit of bugs let me tell you I think that's all for now rain is a coming <laughs> I feel like I'm in the hundred acre wood, like I'm Christopher Robin <laughs> and Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore and Piglet should like emerge from one of these trees. It's been a lovely time talking with you. Uh, I like taking you with me <laughs> to the park, wherever. And uh, just know that even though I have not been putting up Bach performances lately or teaching tips, it is on my mind. I want to make content. I really love doing that. Um, but I also have real gigs, which I love too. <laughs> but I'm gonna go get myself a slushy, or a, what do they call it? Um, slush puppy. <laughs> I love slush puppies. <laughs> Maybe a red one or a blue one, I don't know. We are hot, we need a slush puppy. So thanks for uh, hanging out with me and being patient while I work to get back to making regular content. YouTube gave me a message today that said, Penny, your views are down because you have not been putting up content as often as usual. <laughs> and boy, do I know it. But you are still here, so I thank you for that. More to come. And uh, on that note, my books and I, and my Steinway hammer, <laughs> and my keys to keep away the coyote, will bid you farewell. Happy practicing, stay well, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.